It is my pleasure to welcome to the to the stage His Excellency uh, Yamin Oshimbajo, the <laughs> Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Thank you very much. Please sit. Thank you. Um, let me begin by thanking the board and management of the Center for Global Development for this kind invitation to share some thoughts on a just and equitable uh, transition. And thank you, uh, Ju uh, Jude Moore, or Jide Moore, for a more Nigerian, a more Nigerian way of calling that name. And um, all of the members of the Institute who are, who are here, and of course, friends and colleagues uh, here also. I, I think the uh, central thinking to, for most developing countries is that we are confronted on this issue of a just transition, uh, is that we're really confronted with two, not one uh, existential crisis. The climate crisis, of course, is the, the, the central issue, but also e extreme poverty. So for us, it's not just the climate crisis, there's also the crisis of, of, of extreme poverty in the developing world. The clear implication of this is, uh, is that our plans and commitments to carbon neutrality must include clear plans on energy access if we are to confront poverty. This includes access to energy for consumption and productive use, spanning across electricity, heating, cooking, and other end use sectors. But both the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and the conflict in Ukraine have had severely damaging effects on decades worth of gains made in the energy sector in developing countries, particularly in the most vulnerable countries and those already lagging in energy access. Nearly 90 million people in Asia and Africa who have previously gained access to electricity can no longer afford to pay for their basic energy needs. The inflationary pressures caused by the COVID-19 pandemic and, all, and its after effects and other macroeconomic trends have been further exacerbated by the ongoing war in Ukraine. Countries worldwide have been hit by record high prices on all forms of energy. Power prices are breaking records across the globe, especially in countries or markets where natural gas plays a key role in the energy mix. So as the supply of gas from existing sources becomes restricted, developing countries using gas are forced to compete with the European countries who are scrambling to replace Russian energy with supply from other partners, and of course, this is driving up prices. This dynamic itself is compounded by the food and financial crisis also experienced by many countries as a result again of the war in Ukraine. But a subtext of the unfolding drama is the double standards evident in the response to the current energy crisis by, by many countries in the global north. Today, as I'm sure many of us know, uh, excluding South Africa, the remaining one billion people in Sub-Saharan Africa are serviced by uh, an installed capacity of just 81 gigawatts of power. Sub-Saharan Africa has contributed, again, you know, uh, information that's already out there, that one has contributed less than 1% of cumulative uh, CO2 emissions. By comparison, the United States has an installed capacity of 1,200 gigawatts of power a pop to a population of 331 million people, while the United Kingdom, for example, has 76 gigawatts of installed capacity for its 67 million people. The per, capita, the per capita energy capacity in the UK is almost 15 times that in sub-Saharan Africa. 
But many of these countries had barely a year ago seriously advocated or implemented policies on limiting public funding for fossil, uh, for fossil fuel projects in developing countries, making no distinction between upstream oil and coal exploration and gas power plants for grid balancing. But today, in the wake of the energy crisis, many European nations have made recent announcements to increase or extend their use of coal-fired power yeah, for generating power through 2023 and potentially beyond. Of course, this is in violation of their climate commitments, and analysis suggests that this will raise power sector emissions of the EU by 4%. A significant amount, and that's you know considerable given the high base denominator of EU emissions. But also worthy of note is that Europe's energy crisis has not been ignored. It continues to be met with support and international resources. In stark contrast, the developing world is still being held to account on its emission reduction without adequate support and investment for their energy transitions. The point being made is that the climate crisis and our commitments to resolve it would involve significant sacrifices from all, and not just poorer countries. If the default position of the wealthier nations, once their energy comfort is threatened, is to resort to the dirtiest fuels, then we may be on a recursive path, one step forward, two steps backwards. Demand management or energy efficiency measures is the sensible option to meet the current challenges that face uh, our countries, not recommissioning old uh, coal-fired power plants. Another point to be made is that while Africa's current unmet energy needs are huge, future demand will be even greater due to expanding populations, urbanization, and movement into the middle class. It is clear that the continent must address its energy constraints and would require external support and a good measure of policy flexibility to deliver this. Unfortunately, in the wider responses to the climate crisis, we're not seeing careful consideration and acknowledgement of Africa's aspirations. For instance, despite the tremendous energy gaps, Global policies are increasingly constraining Africa's energy technology choices. With the Kigali communique and several other formal and informal consultations, African nations are now happily more intentional in taking joint ownership of our transition pathways and designing climate-sensitive strategies that address our growth objectives. This is what Nigeria has done, especially with our energy transition plan. The plan itself, the Nigeria's energy transition plan, was designed to, take, to tackle the dual crisis of energy poverty and climate change and deliver SDG 7 by 2030 and net zero by 2060, while centering the provision of energy for development, industrialization, and economic growth. We anchored the plan on key objectives, including lifting 100 million people out of poverty in this decade, driving economic growth, bringing more modern energy services to the full population, and managing the expected long-term job losses in the oil sector due to global de uh, decarbonization. Given these objectives, the plan recognizes the role that natural gas must play in the short term, is short to medium term, to facilitate the establishment of baseload energy capacity and address the nation's clean cooking deficit in the form of LPG, which is why they are limiting public investments in gas projects as a critical energy transition pathway for Africa poses dire challenges for African nations and we believe violates the enshrined principles of equity and justice while making an insignificant dent in global emissions. Several countries, including the US, China, Japan, and uh, large parts of Asia, and the EU, still include gas as a major pillar of their multi-decadal uh, uh, decarbonization strategies, including actively 
using African gas from countries like Mozambique, Ghana, Senegal, and Nigeria. In such a global reality, limiting financing of gas projects for domestic use would pose a severe challenge to the pace of economic development, delivery of electricity access, and clean cooking solutions, and the scale up and integration of renewable energy into the energy mix. Also, our energy transition plan finds that an additional 10 billion US dollars over business as usual is required annually till 2060 to shift the entire economy to a net zero pathway. However, there is, a, there is currently a dramatic mismatch in energy investments. While representing just 15% of the world's population, high income countries received 40% of global energy investments in uh, 2019. Conversely, developing countries with 40% of the world's population receive just 15% of global energy investment, and that hasn't improved much uh, in, in, uh, in, 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 in recent years. Energy consumption in developing countries has doubled in the last 15 years and is expected to grow another 30% in the next 15 years. Making capital available to fulfill the growing energy demand in these regions through renewables is central to reaching the goal of the Paris Agreements. All of our na national determined contributions under the Paris Agreements require an unprecedented scale of investments to flow into the African continent. An energy mix compatible with a 1.5 uh, uh, zero Celsius pathway would require 40 billion US dollars to flow into sub Saharan Africa annually, a fourfold increase compared to the 10 billion US dollars invested uh, since 2018. Further, the energy access element of the, of the transition must be linked with the emissions reductions aspect of the energy transition. For too long, we've considered these two as parallel tracks. If energy access issues are left unaddressed, we'll continue to see growing energy demand being addressed with high polluting and deforesting fuels such as diesel, kerosene, and firewood. As a result, efforts aimed at advancing climate goals must first and foremost create carbon space for growing economies that have historically made neg negligible contributions to global emissions and have an obligation to their people to provide access to energy for electricity, for cooking, and productive uses. The, the ultimate goal of the global energy transition should be to achieve reliable net zero carbon energy systems to power prosperous, inclusive economies. In the Nigerian context, that means building sustainability into our economic planning. We have developed an economic, we developed an economic sustainability plan in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic, which included an ambitious plan over the near term to provide 5 million homes and SMEs with cleaner energy through our decentralized solar power program. This meant that 25 million Nigerians would have access to solar power. The first phase of this plan is already underway, and we think that this sort of program will very quickly ramp up progress towards net zero emissions. But to ramp up action, we have presented evidence that shows that gas is critical to integrating a greater share of renewable energy in Nigeria's energy mix. Limited grid systems generally have trouble integrating in, uh, intermittent sources above 15% of generation. However, those in, uh, intermittent renewables can increase to over 30% of generation when enabled by a similar share of natural gas. In order to drive the uh, energy transition at scale, we need to take a comprehensive approach. We have to work jointly towards common goals, including the market and environmental opportunities presented by the financing of clean energy assets in growing energy markets. To this end, in addition to conventional capital flows from public and private sources, it's essential that Africa can participate more fully in the global uh, carbon finance market. Currently, direct carbon pricing systems through carbon taxes have largely been concentrated in high and middle income countries. But carbon markets can play a very significant role in catalyzing sustainable energy deployment. 
by directing private capital into climate action and improving global energy security, providing diversified incentive structures, especially in developing countries, and providing an impetus for clean energy markets when the price economics looks less compelling, as is the case today. So supporting Africa to develop into a global supplier of carbon credits, ranging from biodiversity to energy-based credits, will be a leap forward in aligning uh, carbon pricing and related policy around a just uh, transition. I, th also, I also think that it's becoming quite evident that a just transition is key, not only to ensuring equity in climate policy, but also in building market structures that incentivize climate action, such as well-functioning carbon markets. Given the escalating debt, and you know, I think uh, th th this might also be a point to consider, especially when we look at the escalating debt situations of many uh, developing countries, especially in the aftermath of the pandemic and the Russian-Ukrainian uh, crisis. I think we should also bring debt for climate swaps into the climate finance mix. Now, debt for climate swaps, are, as uh, many might know, are a type of debt swap where bilateral or multilateral debt is forgiven by creditors <coughs> in exchange for a commitment by the debtor to use outstanding debt service payments for national climate action programs. So typically the creditor country or institution agrees to forgive a part of the debt if the debtor country would pay the uh, avoided debt service payment into a local currency, transparent local currency account, or an exco, or any other kind of transparent fund. And the funds must then be used for agreed climate projects in the debt of country. So we can actually increase the fiscal space for climate-related investments and reduce the debt burden for participating developing countries. There are, of course, you know, uh, very significant policy actions that will be necessary to make this, uh, to make uh, DFCs or uh, uh, these sort of swaps more acceptable and sustainable. But I think that the, the, the important thing is that it's a win-win uh, because obviously it contributes to the NDCs of the creditor country and it creates the fiscal space necessary for climate investments for the uh, debtor countries. So let me conclude by um, commending again the Global Institute uh, for the excellent work that you do on such a wide variety of important development issues. But in particular, uh, for the opportunity to... Uh, share uh, some of these thoughts with you, and also for encouraging uh, different narratives, especially from uh, the developing world here. So I must thank you again. Thank you very much all for listening. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. And now we will have uh, our member of the CGD board, Outstanding bachelors who will uh, facilitate the conversation with uh, His Excellency. Afsani. Your Excellency, thank you for that incredibly thoughtful talk. Thank you. Uh, as always, I learned a lot from you. Thank you. And I have worked on Nigeria for many years when I was at the World Bank. In fact, I started the bank's natural gas group. Wow. So, so, <laughs> <laughs> but then I went on to do renewables. So I agree with everything you said. Let's put it this way. <laughs> it was music uh, to my ears. So thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think um, His Excellency has uh, talked a lot about the opportunities, really. They're the challenges, but they're also the opportunities mm -hmm. in um, that the energy sector uh, provides mm. to, um, to the continent of Africa and really to the rest of the world. Investors who are looking for good investments, both multilateral institutions as well as the private sector. So I'd like to maybe dig deeper a little bit to uh, some of the questions that you uh, mentioned. But, um, but I think the only thing that I wanted to mention, uh, because you really went through all the statistics and, you know, in terms of the the inequity of a billion people who are not getting the energy that 
they should get at the same time as they're not getting the investments coming in. I think the other side, on the positive side I wanted to mention, which I think is really important, again, in my day job now in the private sector um, at Rock Creek, we've been investing a number, in a number of Nigerian companies, mm -hmm. from uh, banking to manufacturing to, um, to many startups. And I have found that um, one of the largest, most um, prestigious accelerators, uh, which is called Y Combinator, yeah. Their first set of investments, their largest, is in the U.S. The second is Canada. The third is Nigeria. Yeah. That is huge. And that is really the part of your entrepreneurs. And, um, and that's why I think um, as we talk about the energy sector, I'd also like to ask you about the climate smart because there's just so much opportunity there. Mm. But you've argued, um, Your Excellency, that curbing natural gas investments in Africa will do little to limit carbon emissions globally, given the size currently, right. but it will do much more to hurt the continent's economic prospects. As you said, Europe right now um, has said that it needs another decade of natural gas and other uh, hydrocarbons to reach its um, 2050 climate goals. Um, Africa, which much bigger challenges, but also a potential for much bigger growth, um, you know, can have another 10 years, can have another 20 years. But if you sort of put on your forecasting, where would you like it to be in 10 years? Where would you like it to be in 20 years in Africa? The share of hydrocarbons, particularly natural gas, which is cleaner than the other hydrocarbons, but also the share of clean fuels. Hmm. <laughs> OK, thank you very much indeed. And thank you so much for the uh, very kind comments. I First of all, let me say that um, just in terms of where we should be, where we should be in the future with, with, with fossil fuels, I think that we have a very strong commitment to renewable energy. We have a very strong commitment to clean energy. And part of the reason, of course, is that again, we have, I mean, radiation is high in many parts of our country. Yeah. So we have all that it takes to benefit tremendously from renewable energy. And I don't think any purpose is served by uh, a continued use of fossil fuels, especially where they will eventually create climate damage and all of that. And the only thing is that we must match it with our energy access needs and development needs. That, that's, that's, that just is, 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 a major, is a major issue. But I think that what we will find, and, and, I, and, I, and I hope that I'm right in, in this projection, is that what we'll find is that with the coming years, renewable energy will just become much more effective in delivering even on industrial needs. Mm -hmm. Today, base load that's required for industry can't be derived from renewable energy alone. So you are still going to need, mm -hmm. you know, uh, gas, you know, in our case, gas. So I think that in the coming years, we are not going to be hard put to make a decision as to reducing uh, our gas needs or fossil fuel needs generally, because there will be an uptake in the reliability and uh, in the efficiency of, of renewable energy. And I think that uh, that's the direction that the, that the world is going. You know, uh, a few years ago, we didn't know that we could get the sort of quality of batteries that we, well, we have now. Now we have, you know, much more efficient batteries. So things are looking up. So I, I, I'm not going to uh, fall in the trap of, <laughs> of predicting how many years from now. I like the fact that... Uh, some countries are saying a decade uh, from now, but I suspect that they will readjust that as the time, except, of course, if things change uh, dramatically. So I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic that with the with efficiency in, 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 in renewable energy, we'll be able to say we, we, we will do away with fossil fuels in, 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 in the not too distant future. As a matter of fact, if you look at some of the talk, uh, some of the, uh, just to your point about entrepreneurship in Nigeria and the opportunities that are available, uh, one of the critical areas is with electric cars. You know? So despite the energy problems that we have, there is a clear, you, know, you can see that young people are talking a lot more now 
about uh, the use of electric. As a matter of fact, you know, uh, there are those who are already saying that, look, rather than keep talking about combustion engines or even auto gas, you know, let's focus on electric cars, you know, develop public charging facilities, develop more efficient electric cars, and, and, and just given uh, the, the, the zest and, you know, the, uh, the creativity of, of many of these entrepreneurs, I, I think that we might see that um, we leapfrog into electric cars much faster than, than people may have imagined. It's really, really interesting. I think uh, because, um, as you said, the, uh, particularly in Nigeria, but the whole uh, continent and, and particularly sub-Saharan Africa, not all countries obviously have the natural gas reserves that you do in Nigeria, which is yes. a very fortunate thing. Uh, but the wind and the, and the, uh, and the solar are yeah. very powerful. Uh, the other side of things that have been talked about is the fact that a lot of facilities that you might buy, build today to develop your natural gas could be later on used for, um, for hydrogen. Absolutely. Um, so have you been looking at some of those right mm, now in mm, Nigeria? Mm, mm. Our, our, our transition plan, uh, I could, our yes. energy transition plan, sorry. Our energy sorry. transition plan actually in, uh, has uh, that in mind, and um, you would find that we are actually looking at um, the possible use of hydrogen as one of the uh, renewable options that we have. So it's a, it's a, a it, it's certainly being considered. There isn't much to go by yet, you know. Uh, there isn't. We haven't found anyone who has uh, done any great things it's with early. blue or green <laughs> hydrogen. But it certainly is in our plan, you know, and uh, we mentioned it specifically as, as, one of the, as one of the options. But I think that we will be looking, I think we'll be looking also for how to, uh, uh, how to go in that direction. But maybe we'll be looking more for guidance from those who have a little more resources than ourselves so that we're not the guinea pigs in the hydrogen experiment, you know, yeah. Absolutely. You've mentioned the word, the number 400 billion as, yes. uh, as the number needed for new investments mm -hmm. above and beyond current spending uh, to meet the net zero pledge, and you mentioned it just a few minutes earlier also. Um, in an ideal world, what would be the areas that you would like the private sector to come in mm -hmm. to finance? Yeah. Is there any particular yeah. areas? Quite a few areas. Again, we, 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 have, a very, we have great detail mm -hmm. in, 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 the, in our uh, transition plan. But just looking at you know, generation, transmission, generation, transmission, distribution, you know, those are areas where we certainly will be looking for you know, substantial investment. Again, because of where we're starting in terms of you know, energy access, these are huge areas where we would want to see, you know, and of course in the whole area of renewable energy, in um, even transportation, uh, we, we just talked about uh, electric vehicles uh, and all of that, buildings, you know. So there, are, it's, it's a whole range, but we, you know, just in terms of the specifics in the whole, you know, the, the generation, uh, transmission distribution in the power sector, you know, transportation, uh, buildings, these are areas where, I mean, renewable energy, of course, these are areas where we're looking uh, for, for considerable investments. Of course, uh, our, our, our whole approach to this is to seek, especially from the multilaterals and the DFIs that we're talking to, is to seek um, the, sorts of, uh, the sorts of funding that will assist in creating efficient energy markets. Because we think that the, that the way that this will grow, the way this would work, is for us to create these markets, to create the efficient markets that the private sector will be interested in coming into. So we're not looking at um, some kind of a once and for all type funding, or, you know. We're, we're looking more at collaboration with DFIs with the private sector in improving the efficiency of the markets, of the energy markets. So that this becomes, you know, and you know, this this is becomes a dynamic uh, a situation where the energy market itself is it's its own publicity. It's, it, it, it you know it tells the world, you know, just what uh, 
and uh, why it is important to invest in it and why it's important to invest in, 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 our, in our economic in our energy transition plan. It's interesting you mentioned the multilaterals. I, um, as I mentioned, I did work at the World Bank a number of years, <laughs> including on uh, the energy transition story as well as finance. But um, if you sort of um, met with the management of the World Bank today or you know the other multilaterals and the other DFIs, what would be your message? What could they do better to help Nigeria, to help the rest of Africa that they're not doing today? Mm. And how could they also leverage, like you said, the, right. this, um, getting the private sector and the public sector to, to become big investors right. in Africa? Right. I, uh, again, I think the major thing for us, you know, I'm just looking, just restricting it to the way that we're trying to promote our energy transition plan. I think the major issue is how to accelerate and how to make our markets more efficient. So the type of funding that, um, and this is why we're not saying, look, we're not looking for some kind of grant for public spending. We're looking more at how you know, uh, we can use the funding to make our markets better, make our markets more efficient. As a matter of fact, the, the World Bank has done some fairly, you know, some very useful uh, work in this area with respect to renewable energy. So we have um, a, we have a, uh, what, what's called the Nigeria uh, Electricity, um, the, the NEP, that's the uh, electrification project, Nigeria Electrification Project. And how that has played out is that so we are installing in various places, we're installing solar home systems, mini grids, and all of that. Now, these are private sector companies that are installing this. You know, some of it is part of what we call a Solar Niger program, a program to, to have solar home systems and uh, mini grids in 5 million homes. That's a huge program by itself, which was in response to the economic sustainability, in, in response to the COVID-19 mm -hmm. Uh, pandemic. Now, what the World Bank has then done is to say, okay, for every connection that is made, we'll pay X amount of money, right? It's about $300 or so per connection. I think it's gone a bit higher than that now. And so the point of that is that that really encourages the private, it encourages private investors mm -hmm. because they know that, you know, the exposure is much less by the amount of money that uh, the World Bank is giving. So that facilitation, that little subsidy has been a great help in opening up the, 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 that, that market to very many investors. Mm -hmm. So bigger investors, you know, uh, and we've had quite, you know, including banks, are very interested in the project and are investing, you know, quite large sums in, yeah. even our sovereign wealth fund has gotten involved, you know, and several other mm -hmm. um, private banks have gotten involved in it as well because the exposure is much less by, uh, what, uh, the, by the support that the World Bank is giving per connection. So I think that these sorts of, uh, uh, the, the, these sorts of assistance that are targeted mm -hmm. at improving the market, at assisting the public sector, and at de-risking many, uh, 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 many of these enterprises and many of these things is really what, we would, what we're looking at. So, uh, we, we're saying to the World Bank, for instance, that we want this uh, program expanded mm -hmm. so that our economic uh, uh, energy transition plan can benefit from uh, this, uh, the, the program that uh, electrification project uh, benefited from. And uh, they're looking at how to increase uh, the, uh, how to increase their funding specifically for, for that purpose. So those, those are the really types of interventions right. that we think uh, will be could useful, be yes. And I suppose what they've learned to do in Nigeria, they yes. could also apply to other countries. Absolutely, in to other countries, Africa. yes. Um, I was also curious, 10 African countries, including Nigeria, have signed the Kigali um, Communique on Sustainable Energy. Could you tell us, uh, for the benefit of our audience, what the 
communique says and why you put it in place. Mm -hmm. And um, that would be very helpful. Yes. I think, you know, by and large, the communique addresses or seeks to address many of the concerns of African countries and some of those that I've already uh, spoken about. And I, uh, and I think first the most important thing about the communique is that perhaps for the first time, African countries have come together to take ownership of, uh, of, of the narrative on, uh, zero, on, on our pathways to zero emissions by 2050, 2060 or whenever and also our narrative on energy access and what our concerns are about energy access. So if you look point by point at the uh, Kigali communique, that's exactly what the, 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 the communique seeks to, to address. The various issues on energy access, the various issues on, on, on uh, decarbonization and how it is that this, how it is that we will achieve uh, our targets and what kind of support is required from yeah from the rest of the world in order to achieve uh, 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 net zero ambitions and also at the same time to address questions of extreme poverty and development. So th those are the that, that's the sum and substance of uh, of the Kigali communique. But I think what a major takeaway for us, you know, is the fact that African countries are speaking with one voice on this issue. And of course, as we go towards COP27 in Egypt, that's important, you know, and we're having a few other meetings. And of course, there are some informal consultations, but we're having a few other meetings to uh, fine tune uh, thoughts around uh, following from the Kigali uh, community, but also more importantly, the changing circumstances, the, the changing circumstances are practically every day in the world. So I think it's, you know, it's a very positive thing indeed. And uh, many of us, of course, were very excited that this was an opportunity where we're all speaking mm -hmm. uh, with one voice. And sometimes, of course, where you, you know, Francophone, Anglophone, Lucophone, everyone, you know, coming together to do this. I think it was really, you know, quite exciting for us all. Wonderful. I have a lot of other questions, but yes. I think we should go to the audience because I know mm -hmm. the audience has questions for you, and we also have um, uh, people who are um, on um, sure. on streaming who are uh, sure. who also have questions. So uh, let me invite our audience to see if there are any questions, please. And we can also go to the social media. Sorry, go ahead, please. And if you could introduce yourself. Yes. Hi, my, is this working? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Vice President, thank you for a very enlightening and informative presentation. My name is uh, Johnny Carson, and I have one question. Carson. Uh, okay, so, all right. I just wanted to be sure of the name here. Yeah. Okay. One question. Have you had an opportunity to discuss your concerns about uh, energy transition with the U.S. Special Envoy uh, for Climate Change, uh, Secretary, former Secretary of State John Kerry. Yeah. Uh, and could you uh, share uh, with us any of the uh, comments uh, that have come from the U.S. side uh, on this issue? Thank you. Should I go, to go ahead, ahead with that? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, Mr. John Kerry is meant to come, I think, in November. He's coming over to Nigeria. Nigeria. Where, where is Damla? 13th. 13th. On the 13th of November. So we will get a chance to, uh, to talk to him extensively about this. You know, and of course, a, it will be a fantastic opportunity for us. You know, but so when he comes, we'll get a chance to, to, to talk to him. Wonderful. I think there was a question here. Uh, <clears throat> Hi, good, af good afternoon. My name is Nee Simmons. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't get the name. My name is Nee Simmons. I used to work at the World Bank Group. I actually created, uh, I was the architect for the African Diaspora Program. My question to you is, wh what is the, the Nigerian government doing to em embrace and engage um, 
Nigerian diaspora professionals to support uh, its development goals, especially around, you had mentioned so eloquently about the transition from renewables. I've talked to many Nigerians and they've had a challenge time to get projects off the ground. They feel like the government is not doing enough to support. Um, I've got a background in, in um, investment finance and so, some of these uh, professionals, especially in the US, UK, your, your diaspora um, are, are uh, finding it difficult. And uh, my question is, what are you doing? What are some things that you guys can do or can the Nigerian government do or hasn't done to engage and embrace your diaspora professionals that you haven't done before? Yeah, okay. Uh, let me just very quickly say that uh, first, practically all of those who are involved in uh, investments in, uh, in renewable energy in particular and in the power sector in Nigeria, you know, are indigenous companies, young people, some diaspora, some uh, Nigerians who work within Nigeria. I think uh, without necessarily looking for a policy that would encourage diaspora Nigerians from part in participating in the local in the local industry, I think the point really is ensuring that anyone can participate, which is what we uh, which is what we uh, will try to do with our economic sustainability plan, um, which is the point I was making about the way that um, the World Bank has, and other uh, DFIs have supported the particular effort, which, which, which is, uh, and a lot of this has to do with renewables. I was just talking about the solar power, five million people and all that. And it hasn't been particularly difficult. As a, as a matter of fact, it's one of the most successful programs where individuals, companies have come forward and have been able to participate, get capital, get some subsidy from, uh, the, 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 from, from the World Bank and all of that, and been able to implement several projects. Our Sovereign Wealth Fund has been a part of this. The NNPC has been a part of this, you know, and several, other, yeah, several others have contributed significantly to it. So I think there's plenty of room to operate, you know. Uh, there may be some constraints, but we're engaged, you know, almost on a daily basis with several uh, entrepreneurs and several companies who are coming in to, uh, to work with us. I, have, I came here with uh, Ahmad Zakari, who is uh, advisor on infrastructure. Maybe you might want to also talk to him a bit more. He's, uh, he's right here. Yeah. Ahmad lives here. Uh -huh. So he's, you know, he's engaged directly with uh, a lot of the private sector companies that are working in this area. And um, it's almost a hand-holding exercise for, you know, ensuring that they're able to get uh, the very best uh, support for doing, uh, for, for investing in these areas. So I think that, you know, we're, we're, we're well, we're open. We're, you know, ready for business, as they say. Yeah. I think there's a question here. The front. Yes. Do I need a mic? I yes. Very... Hi, thank you. Uh, hi, Mr. Vice President. Um, Gail Smith from the One Campaign. Um, a couple questions for you. The first one's short. The second one's something we haven't touched on yet. You talked about the Kigali communique, and mm -hmm. I'm in strong agreement with you that that common voice from the continent has a huge impact. I'd be interested as to whether you think there is a good or better than even chance that Africa will go into the next round of cotton negotiations with a common position on this. The, the second question is about jobs. And I'd be interested in hearing how you see the connection between building out, whether it's natural gas as a transitional fuel or the renewable sector, how you relate that to the also uh, really acute need to create more jobs. Is that part of the plan? Okay. All right. Thanks. So the so, I think that all our effort is geared towards being able to present a common position. Fortunately for us, again, uh, COP twenty seven is going to be in Africa. So, I think there's a sense, uh, a great deal of excitement around. This is our chance. This is our opportunity. 
which is what drove the, uh, uh, the, the, the Kigali communique itself and drove consensus, you know. And from everything that I have seen from, you know, uh, dealing and talking to several of, the, several of the leaders all around Africa on this issue, I think we have the best possible chance of being able to present a, a common position in the negotiations going forward, especially beginning with COP27. Uh, regarding jobs and um, gas, I say, I think that, you know, in fact, one of the major uh, concerns that we had when we started what we, what we call the Solar Niger program, which was a renewable energy program uh, where we hope to be able to get uh, renewable energy, solar in particular, into 5 million homes not just uh, home systems, but also off-grid systems and all of them, um, mini-grids also. We were concerned primarily about jobs, you know, because the whole point, it was not just, you know, electrifying the, the communities, but also giving opportunities for job creation. And we found that that has worked very, very well indeed, you know, because just doing the installations, maintenance, you know, and the whole financing arrangements around it, even collections, you know, even uh, the, the co collection of uh, the tariffs, payments, and all of that, have created opportunities all around. So, I, so, so we think that just expanding the scope, because we have the numbers. I mean, we have the, we have the numbers, we have the scope to cover. And what that simply means is that we actually can create opportunities, you know, just by virtue of the fact that we're engaged in this and we're involved in this. So I think the trick really is to get in the investments so that we can actually do more work and we can actually, you know, engage more people. And, and so I, I, I'm quite confident that if we keep on track, you know, and um, we are able to ensure that we, and there, of course, there are several policy issues also around investments that we need to work on, you know, there are questions that we, are, that, that we have to address around exchange rates and all of those kinds of things. I think if we're able to deal with those issues, we should be able to get in the sorts of investments we need and, of course, create jobs as a result. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, one last question, either from the audience or the social media, or I, I don't know if we have time for that. One more question from either here or social media, whichever, whoever puts their hand up I'll just take faster. The, the host privilege. <laughs> Good. <laughs> and ask the question. Mr. VP, you, you've, you know, in my introduction, I wasn't being hyperbolic when I said that, you know, there are a few people more um, qualified to address this topic. You've established yourself on this question of, of, of transition. I, I was just wondering, uh, you're gonna meet, well, maybe you already have met with US government officials while you were here, and you've met with European governments. What has the response been to, mm -hmm. to this, to, to, to this uh, at least as much as you can tell us? I, I think by and large, um, there has been a good measure of understanding of the African position, of our position. I think um, we have not met with uh, any great difficulty in understanding the position. And I think that, um, again, because we are, because this is evolving, and, and, and it, it's, it's helped a great deal, I think um, in a perverse way, the Russia-Ukraine conflict has also helped you know, to demonstrate that um, what we're asking is not unreasonable, you know, and that if you have an energy crisis, your response to it is most likely going to be what favors you and what sorts of resources you have available, you know. In our case, this, this crisis is existential. It's not, it's not, it's, it's not, just, a, it's not just caused by the, 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 the war. It's an existential crisis for us because we have a developmental crisis. So we need to be able to deal with these questions on an ongoing basis and, you know. So I think that everyone is a lot more, you know, uh, have understanding of, of where we are and why we're, make, why we're saying what we're saying about using gas as a transition fuel. And um, I think also 
just looking at the way that uh, the conversation is developing, I think that we are uh, doing quite well because um, everyone realizes that um, perhaps we may not be able to throw uh, all fossil fuels away immediately, especially gas. And um, so, so it's been it, it, it's been quite uh, our, our views have been quite um, have been taken with a good measure of understanding. Thank you, Your Excellency. I was going to say, you know, you were sort of ahead when you brought that message before the war. Yes. The war, as you said, has made has it helped. more obvious. Yes. Uh, the only point that I would mention is that natural gas, we never thought in our lifetime would be like eight, nine, ten dollars, you know. It was kind of stuck at two, three, four. Absolutely. And given where it is, and given specifically Nigeria's economy and its importance in natural gas, um, but also the availability of the other renewable fuels, it's not a bad export fuel uh, mm -hmm. for revenues while you're building out what you said, Absolutely. Uh, everything you said about renewables. So it puts Nigeria in a very good place. Absolutely. Together with your next generation, as you talked about, and your young people who are starting these uh, entrepreneurial um, activities in Nigeria. But I wanted to take the, um, uh, you know, on behalf of the CGD board and, and, uh, and Masoud Ahmed, uh, our leader here, uh, and everybody uh, on the team here to thank you especially for what you're doing in Nigeria, for what you're doing for the continent, for your leadership, and to thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you.